hello, good evening. Uh, my name is James Vanek. I'm an Assistant Director of the Global Systems Institute at the University of Exeter, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to In the Conversation uh, with George Monbiot. Um, what we're going to discuss this evening is the role of universities uh, in a time of climate and ecological crisis, and the format is going to be George and I are going to talk for approximately 45 minutes, and then we are going to open the floor to questions from people in the audience here and the many hundreds, I think, of people who are joining online. So just to give you some brief context, um, the temperature records in September for this year were described variously as gobsmackingly bananas. Um, there has been a series of marine heat waves. There was an astonishing intensification of Hurricane Otis, which in the space of 24 hours went from an unremarkable tropical storm of 50 miles per hour winds to a category five hurricane with sustained wind speeds of 165 miles per hour before it then hurtled into Acapulco in Mexico. If we've been talking about dangerous climate change as something that's happening uh, or might happen in the past, well, dangerous climate change is here now, and we are certainly living in an age of climate and ecological crisis. So what is the role of universities? What is the role of higher education, um, specifically perhaps in the UK, but maybe in a broader context? What are we meant to be doing in an educational context to supply young people with the knowledge, the skills, the opportunities that they will need to be able to navigate this crisis? So I'm extremely pleased to be able to welcome George for us to have this discussion. George needs very little introduction. In fact, if I was to try to introduce him, that would be the next 45 minutes because he has an extensive series of achievements and outputs over a journalism writing career of over 30 years. His first book, uh, was published in 1989, Poisoned Arrow, which is, I would like to describe it as almost a madcap adventure around Indonesia as a young man, doing uh, vital research and investigative journalism about the forced displacement of people in Indonesia. I think he might have written eight books in total. His latest book is Regenesis, which is looking at examining the unsustainable nature of our industrialized agriculture, but then really importantly, charting a route towards what you might consider to be sustainable uh, food systems. He's been writing a weekly column for the Guardian newspaper since uh, 1996, and through that has brought to public awareness a whole series of political, economic, and social issues. He was awarded the UN Global 500 Award uh, in 1995, and in 2022, the Orwell Prize for Journalism in recognition of his many decades of extraordinary contributions uh, to our public understanding of environmental, social, and political issues. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to the University of Exeter, George Monbiot. So I think um, my first question is gonna be, um, given the scale of the challenge that we've got, um, what do young people, what do young people need to know about this thing that we call the climate and ecological crisis? What mm -hmm. kind of things should they be learning at university, and maybe in school as well? Yeah. Thanks, James. And uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I mean, I think it's most accurate to describe this as an Earth systems crisis, because what we see is uh, extremely dangerous assaults on every single aspect of the earth system whether it's the atmosphere whether it's the oceans whether it's the forests the soils um, every ecosystem the cryosphere the world's ice and snow and as a result of this um, uh, assault we are in the midst of what could be unless we radically change course and very rapidly change course the sixth great earth systems collapse now, you might say, uh, hang on a moment, <laughs> if it's the sixth one, what were the other five? Well, they're the five things we call the mass extinctions. The mass extinctions are the Phanerozoic era, the Phanerozoic being the past 600 million years. Uh, most of you won't remember the start of it, but I'm always there. Um, when um, hard shelled, hard uh, pictures with hard body parts first appeared in the fossil record. And we call the, those five previous e events mass extinctions because that's the easiest thing to see. It's what an archeologist or a paleontologist would call taphonomic bias. What, what is preserved um, alters your perception 
of the situation. So, so you can be biased by what you can see. And the easiest thing to see is the disappearance of fossils from the fossil record. Um, and sometimes, in some cases, is extremely stark. You know, a, a great diversity of life, and then almost nothing at all. The the, the biggest instance of this was the Perma Triassic extinction, um, two hundred and fifty one million years ago. You can see the um, immediate aftermath of that in, in the rocks just a few miles from here at Budley Salterton, where you've got these very clear extinction strata. But what they also show you is that extinction is just the symptom of a wider collapse. Um, so in, in at Budley Salterton, what you'll see is that you start off at the bottom of the cliffs. This is on the um, western end of the bay. You'll see the, the pebble beds. They're called the Budley pebble beds. And they're Ordovician pebbles, so they're derived from um, earlier strata, probably from Start Point, where Start Point now is. And there was this sudden erosion event where um, this, basically all the soil, more or less worldwide, was stripped from the land. And that was partly because of the almost total loss of plant, plant life, so there were no roots hold, holding it together. But all, um, and that was triggered by, first of all, toxic outgassing from um, what we now call the Siberian Traps, the huge area of volcanism at the time. Um, and that was then followed by fossil fuel burning on a phenomenal scale. Um, long before there were humans on the planet, the first wave of volcanism capped off the volcanoes um, and prevented the magma from reaching the surface, whereupon it was diverted along these um, sedimentary um, rocks, the sedimentary strata. Um, so you've got sills of magma, magma pushing through and burning off the hydrocarbons in that, that strata, which happened to be um, very rich in, in coal and, and, and other hydrocarbons, created a great pulse of greenhouse gases. And that pretty well finished everything off. And with the combination of the extreme weather and the loss of plants, the soil went from the land. Ocean circulation more or less stopped. The oceans were almost entirely um, deoxygenated. Um, uh, just about every single Earth system went down. And the result was that 90% of species were wiped out. That happened over thousands of years. We're now seeing a similar pulse developing in the course of decades. Um, we believe that the um, main pulse of mass extinction happened. Um, it was a second wave mass extinction at the Perma-Triassic boundary, um, happened um, um, as a result of global heating of between three and five degrees. So this is the scale of what we're looking at. And what, what we've called mass extinctions you know, are in themselves horrendous and enormous, but actually just part of the wider crisis, which is the Earth system's collapse. And what you see at Budley Salterton is above the pebble beds, you have a dark brown line. You really need to do some field trips to, because it's so striking. They're some of the best preserved post-extinction strata anywhere in the world. And they're still horizontally bedded. You can read them like a book. There's a dark brown line on top of the pebble beds where all the stones are sharp, really sharp. You cut your finger on some of them. And this is called the reg, the stable desert surface, which was um, which seemed to have just sat there for hundreds of thousands of years with no effective change in it at all. And those sharp stones are Ventifax or Dracanter, um, which have been sculpted by the wind into sharp points. They were just sitting there for years and years and years being sharpened by the sand blowing in the wind. And then on top of that, you get these perfectly bedded sand dunes. You can still see them following that sand dune shape in the cliffs, which are now through current winds being hollowed out into what look like screaming skulls. It's, it's very powerful seeing those cliffs. And it's, it wasn't for about 5 million years that there was any significant plant life or any significant recovery of biodiversity on Earth. Um, and in fact, at the eastern end of the bay, you can see the first roots of the cycads coming down through the, the strata. Again, some of the best preserved um, ancient fossil plant roots anywhere in the world. You can see those first plants beginning to come back. It was seven million years before there were any coal measures formed on Earth because there just weren't enough plants to form them. We're facing potentially something like that. And that's the extreme end 
of the predictions, but we're beginning to see that the extreme end might not necessarily be the most unlikely of, of the scenarios. In fact, the most unlikely scenario is that nothing very bad happens. Um, so this is the greatest crisis humanity has ever faced, the greatest predicament that humanity has ever faced. And it will only not happen, or some degree of it will only, you know, some degree of it will happen. You know, how far it goes along that spectrum is, is a big question. And there are many brilliant scientists right here working on, on that very question. Some degree of it will happen with business as usual. You know, we all we need to do is nothing to ensure that the the greatest crisis we have ever faced materializes. In order to try to prevent that crisis from materializing, we need to throw at it everything that we have got. We need the collective genius of humanity deployed against it, and. And that doesn't mean just one kind of person, like activists who sit in the road, essential as those people are, and that is a really, really crucial role. For every activist who sits in the road, you need 100 per people behind them um, doing the legal work, doing the accountancy, doing the media work, doing, doing the, the administrat administrative work, or all the other functions that you tend not to see. And... To make sense of it, you need the scientists explaining what we're seeing, explaining what is happening. And then you need the journalists turning what the scientists are saying into a, a recognizable human language. And, and you need, you know, basically what I'm trying to say is that effective campaigning is an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem of everybody bringing their specialisms to bear. And we now need that ecosystem to involve almost everybody. You can't duck out of this challenge. We cannot arrogate to ourselves the luxury of free riding on this one, the luxury of not being a part of the response to the greatest crisis we've ever faced. And so, you know, while we need people to be pursuing their specialisms and doing it as well as they possibly can, we also need people to be resisting the forces that prevent those specialisms from, from gaining political weight. We need to be coming together to create the biggest mass movements that humanity has ever seen. And I'm not calling on everyone to do everything. That's not going to work. Everyone can't do everything. You know, there's some things that we particular people are good at and, and, and particular people aren't good at. But collectively, we have to become that movement. And at university, whether you're on uh, the academic staff, whether you're a student, whether you're on the administrative side, whatever role you play in the university, you're going to be an essential part of this. And it's not, it's not your choice anymore whether you duck out of it. We have to pull together on this. Well, yeah, job done. <laughs> um, so your description of Slapton Sands is very good. You can give my week four lecture. Of a, Oddly salted. I'm oh, sorry. If you go to Slapton Sands, you won't see yeah. that. <laughs> no, we take them to Slapton Sands on one of our yeah. undergraduate yeah. courses. But the 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 end Permian mass extinction event mm. is something that we teach. And we also mm. teach the um, the, the PTM, the Paleocene, Neocene mm. Thermal Maximum, mm. which is sometimes thought as the nearest analogue. We've got mm. to mm. what we've done now, so about 50 million years ago, uh, a period of rapid climate change dumped, you know, best mm. part of a few trillion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And what happened to the biosphere? Well, you know, nothing good, right? Mm -hmm. um, so th this idea that we all have a role to play, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we have a responsibility as educators, um, but then professional services staff have a role. And you mentioned the role of, of protest. Mm -hmm. So one thing that worries me, concerns me greatly, actually, is the kind of responsibility we have to our students, right? right? The duty of care that we have to the young people, typically the young people who spend some time with us. And what I'm seeing is an increasing number of them uh, are kind of marching off into, into, this, into this battle, this battle of ideas, this, this great struggle. And I sometimes wonder if that is a kind of a dereliction of our duty. What, what could we do as educators, as, as an educational establishment, to protect them? And obviously, mm. what we would like is them not to have to do that. No. Right? But they seem to be playing this role. And it's one that I'm becoming increasingly worried about because it's their future. 
mm-hmm. which is going to be in peril. Mm-hmm. And in response to that, they're, they're kind of putting themselves sometimes directly into harm's way and sometimes into prison for many years. Yeah. Well, we do have to do it. And the first thing that a university can do is not impede the people who are doing that, not try to censor them, not try to restrict their activities, not um, bring them before a board to tell them that they will lose their jobs if they do these things or be expelled from the university if they're students. Um, We have to have the freedom to take these actions. Everyone needs that freedom. You know, we, we, we will not be thanked by our children if if we restrict other people's ability to take this essential action and unfortunately a lot of universities just don't get that message at all Mm -hmm. there's this sort of corporatism at work where it's like well what counts is the reputation and the funding of the university and the reputation and the funding of the university hangs on everybody being good corporate citizens and not rocking the boat well sorry in the future it's going to be exactly the opposite any university which impedes people from being genuinely good citizens, which means politically active citizens, will be judged very harshly by, by people who say, well, what were you doing during the climate wars, daddy? Uh-huh. You know, that's, that, that's how it will be seen. And, and, and you know, we have to get beyond the immediate self-interest of the university and its relationship with its funders and its relationship with the government and see this bigger picture. I mean, God knows life is hard enough for those who are putting themselves on the front line, some of whom are are in the audience today, um, because uh, everything is being thrown at them. I mean, the the new laws which have been brought in, such as the 2022 Police Act and the 2023 Public Order Act, alongside all the civil injunctions which are now being deployed uh, against them. In fact, just today we saw news that a certain oil company whose name escapes me has... um, taken out a two uh, is trying to sue Greenpeace for 2.1 million dollars for occupying one of its rigs that oil company is Shell some of you might be familiar with it Um, it's trying to crush protest and they're trying to crush it by every single available Mm -hmm. means by by through the criminal law through civil injunctions they're trying to ruin the lives of activists by basically just taking them down tying them in so many knots that they can't do anything else except defend themselves in these multiple suits that they're facing and all this is being facilitated uh, by governments who are acting at the direct behest of corporations you know the, the the both the police act and the criminal justice act were effectively drafted by this junk tank, this so-called think tank uh, uh, in Westminster called Policy Exchange, which is a, it refuses to say who funds it, but we subsequently found out that, oh, surprise, surprise, it's been funded by Exxon, it's been funded by a whole series of other uh, fossil fuel companies. Um, and it, it produced this report called Extremism Rebellion, saying we got to introduce much harsher laws a- against these uh, these organisations like Extinction Rebellion, subsequently, of course, Insulate Britain and Just Stop Oil, um, and the government gave it everything it wanted. That's just a proxy for corporate power policy exchange. The same with these these other um, neoliberal junk tanks. You know, the Institute of Economic Affairs, the Adam Smith Institute, Centre for Policy Studies. They're just proxies for corporate and oligarchic power. But their role is to try to make the outrageous demands of corporate and oligarchic power look reasonable and turn them into policy, which government can then adopt. And the government can say, oh, no, we're not getting it from the corporations. We're getting it from these independent uh, institutes, these think tanks. Um, and, you know, they're very clever people, these, because they do thinking in their tanks. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then, you know, it's got deniability. It's got plausible deniability. In fact, there's uh, one of the um, public um, relations operatives who who were, who was an intermediary between corporations and think tanks, a man called Jeff Judson, wrote an article explaining why think tanks are the are the right organisations to use for corporations. And one of the top line arguments was because it's deniable, because you know they refuse to say who funds them. Your fingerprints aren't all over it. The the model was established by the tobacco industry. Um, which and there was a there's a, a well-known Philip Morris memo. Philip Morris was a big tobacco company now called Altria, um, which which said um, if we 
um, um, pr promoted um, our own interests in our own names, no one would take us seriously because they know we're a tobacco company promoting cigarettes. And so we have to have some other uh, organization uh, which isn't associated with us speaking on our behalf. And that's what these organizations do. And all over the world now, we're seeing harsher and harsher rules taken out against uh, uh, environmental activists uh, to shut them down, which are effectively written by corporations and their proxies. And so, so given that we have this incredibly harsh environment for protesters, anyone who is not a corporation or their proxy should be pushing back against that and making it as easy as possible for people to protest. And given that, nothing changes without students being involved, mm -hmm. right? Stu student activism is absolutely essential to change and has been for, for generations now. Universities have a particular responsibility to facilitate and protect and look after the students who are protesting. And unfortunately, what I hear in several institutions, including this one, is universities bearing down on those activists, adding to the pressure that they're facing from these earth-destroying organizations and becoming one of those earth-destroying organizations itself in so doing. Okay. <laughs> the, the, okay, so some people might be becoming a little bit uncomfortable um, because there is this notion of academic independence and objectivity, something mm -hmm. we've spoken about before. Um, we might agree with the general thesis, and uh, but to take to be seen to take a position which might be contrary to the government, our, our mm. current government, or maybe a number of governments, mm. that, that kind of political trajectory, mm. is to take a position. And it's not really for academics or universities to take a position. And one thing that I think we might have talked about before is not taking a position is still taking a position. Yeah, right? It's yeah. a position with the status quo. Exactly. Right. Um, so what what could that mean in certain kind of material ways in which we would either deliver education or do the things which would actually support young people who, I mean, because the other thing is that, you know, when we might be of a certain generation where protest on campus was quite common. Mm -hmm. I mean, on my campus, if there wasn't a protest, mm -hmm. it was because it was there was nobody happened. there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think it was mandatory, wasn't it? It felt like that. And there was a protest about everything, every, yeah, yeah. And, and it goes well beyond mainstream political issues. Whereas now, I would argue, and I think you would agree mm -hmm. nowadays, these are a much, there are different environments, yeah. right? So we certainly are not being particularly inclusive mm -hmm. or facilitating mm -hmm. protests. Yeah. And over those, those, those decades, there has been uh, an increasing, maybe overt or maybe indirect ways to suppress the yeah. political vote or the political voice of young people. Mm -hmm. It's a much more transactional relationship we've got with education now. We yeah. put them into debt for a significant amount yeah. of money, mm -hmm. and afterwards we expect them to get jobs and be fully functioning members of society. Yeah. Um, how do you begin to unpick some of those things? Yeah. Well, you, you, you're quite right in suggesting that there is no such thing as political <laughs> neutrality. You know, if someone says they're political, ne politically neutral, it means they side with power. Mm. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and when someone says, oh, I don't do politics, it means they accept the status quo, they accept things as they are. We are all political. What politics means is engagement with other people. And it's a question of the way we engage. And, and if we say, you know, we're not engaging, we're saying we just accept things the way they are. We cannot accept things the way they are because business as usual is the trajectory leading towards global crisis and potentially earth systems collapse. And the fact that we don't know exactly what degree of earth systems collapse we, we, we are facing doesn't mean it doesn't make it any better, it makes it even worse. And, and so we, you know, for a start, we've got to unhook ourselves from this idea that anything we do is, is politically neutral and has no political content. I mean, I, I was, we were having a little seminar before this where we were talking about this issue and, and how, like, um, in the 1990s, there was this big drive by a certain faction of scientists led by a man called um, Lewis Wolpert um, to claim that science was value-free, uh, which is just so fundamentally wrong and, 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 and such such a reflection of hegemony in its own right. What they meant by that was our values are universal values. 
what people like me, Lewis Wolpert, believe is what everyone should believe because this is the unchallengeable truth. Now, we've got a bit beyond that, and I'm very glad to see that. And we see a certain challenge to the hard sciences by the social sciences. We've discussed some of that in our seminar. Um, and, and, and that's a really good thing to see. And it doesn't mean that your science is wrong, but it can mean that actually you need to contextualize it or someone needs to contextualize it and someone needs to see and to try to explain what taking a particular line serves and what taking a different line might serve. And I'm not in any way saying stop what you're doing because what you're doing could be incredibly useful even if we can't see the utility now and actually why should it always be useful anyway? Um, that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a great defender and supporter of, of science, but to just recognize all the time that we, everything we do and believe and think is contingent and it might be contingent on circumstances we haven't even appreciated and haven't even imagined. And we might be, be being driven down a certain line of thought by social forces of which we are completely unaware. That's what hegemony means. Uh, particularly the force identified by Antonio Gramsci of cultural hegemony, that you absorb the perspective of powerful people and you make it your perspective without even knowing that that's what you are doing. And, and that applies almost everywhere. So it's an almost universal function. Now, you know, it doesn't necessarily affect the research that you might be doing, but it can very strongly affect the application of your, that research, the funding of the research, the future direction that that research might take uh, in ways of which, in which you haven't necessarily mm -hmm. con considered. So, you know, I don't have a magic formula for you, and I certainly haven't come here to tell you your, your jobs. Um, you know, I, I, what I'm talking about really is, is your, your uh, role as, as a human being, which goes beyond the job. Um, but it's, you know, the, the challenge I would put out always is to just keep questioning, why am I doing this? Why have I chosen this route and not that route? Why, why do I think that this is the most interesting thing to be doing rather than a huge number of other things to be doing? You know, why, why, have I, why am I um, uh, tunneling within this discipline as opposed to making links with that discipline, for, for example? And, and I'm in no way saying you know, what any one of you is doing is, is a wrong approach because I, I've got no qualifications to, to, to say that at all. But I would say that the gaps in our knowledge are big enough for humanity to fall into and that many of the most important issues of all are scarcely studied at all and scarcely discussed in, in the public domain uh, uh, at all. And I keep stumbling upon issues, some of which are um, in the scientific literature, but but very little known, where I think this actually could be one of the top five existential crises that we face. So, for instance, the possibility of global food system collapse, which could happen quite independently of all the massive environmental and geopolitical pressures on that system, but could happen for very similar reasons to why the financial system almost collapsed in 2008, which is that it loses systemic resilience. And there are papers going back uh, about 10 years now, people warning that exactly that is happening, that, that it's showing a whole series of very worrying signs of losing diversity, losing redundancy, losing modularity, losing backup systems, uh, losing circuit breakers, uh, all, all the elements which contribute to systemic resilience and that it's becoming systemically fragile. And yet there's been no pickup of that anywhere uh, in the media in politics you know people don't know what you're talking about if you, if you try to say yeah you know there's a food system crisis they, oh yeah environmental crisis is going to affect the food system yeah that too but this is actually a different thing for that and and it's a thing which i've got you know i've been writing about it i've done a presentation to parliament done all sorts of things on it and i'm just constantly having people come back to me saying it's something else because they're not familiar with the thing that I'm trying to talk about. And when it comes to the scientists who have been trying to blow the whistle on this, it, 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 they look to me like they're behind a sheet of plate glass and you can see their hands banging and their lips moving, but you can't hear what they're saying. You know, so, so they're doing something absolutely crucial, 
And, you know, they're entirely right in my view to be doing it, but somehow that message is not coming across. People aren't hearing it. The communication channel has failed mm -hmm. for, for some reason. So it's, you know, that we need to be doing everything everywhere all at once, <laughs> effectively. Um, and and the hopeful sign of this is that we have a huge number of brilliant minds to be applying to these problems. But unfortunately, many of those brilliant minds are being dragged off by commercial interests, effectively. You know, we see so many um, graduates being sucked into the financial sector when they could be making an amazing contribution to the science in which they've just graduated, for, for example. Uh, we see universities uh, encouraging that because one of the metrics by which they want to be judged is graduate starting salaries. This is an absolute catastrophe. It's a total disaster. And any university with any self-respect should just scratch that from its metrics. Um, because most, most sectors with high graduate starting salaries are the sectors which are killing the planet. You know, there's lots of money in that because they're extracting um, wealth from everybody else and from Earth systems, including the fossil fuel industry, including the financial sector. You know, the, these are the kind of sectors where you get a high graduate starting salary in return for your soul. So, so perhaps the, the metric should be soul intactness <laughs> rather than graduate starting salary. But it's uh, you know, a big, but as a result of that metric, we have a total d disaster in many careers offices, which is shoving people into that mincing machine in order to try to encourage them to to have those high graduate starting salaries. And there's a real conflict of interest here, because what's good for the student is not necessarily at all what's good for the university rankings in in these cases. And the number of people I've met who went into the city because it's very seductive, it's like a cult. You know, you get the, the, the financial sector comes to the university and it love bombs students. You know, it, it says, oh, you, you know, you're amazing. You're just fantastic. We could give you all this gold. And, and, and people are dragged away from themselves. And then 10 years down the line, you know, they're sucked in, they're locked in because they've got a big mortgage. You know, they've got spending to match their huge salaries and they just fall apart. I've seen this happen to so many people. People of my generation, you know, students I knew who got sucked into that sector. And and they said, oh, I'll just do it for a couple of years, make some money, and then I'll go off and be a photographer. Or then I'll go off and work for Oxfam or, or, or whatever it is. And then, and you know, before they know it, they've met someone who's quite interested in the money and um, they've put, put a deposit down in a house and then their children are in private school. And then, you know, and then you come to them 20 years later and they said, oh, that was just a student dream. And they're, they're blank behind the eyes, you know, they've lost it. And it's a terrible thing to do to students, to push them into these earth-eating sectors. We should never be doing that. Um, you know, the career's advice should be don't, don't pursue these, these lucrative but soul-sapping jobs. And of course, that gets much harder for the reasons you say that students are now being loaded with debt. It's not an accident that that happened. It's not an accident that Nick Clegg broke his promise on, on student finances. It's not an accident that successive governments have been pushing students further and further into debt because that way you've got them, you know, and you can make them dance to, to your tune. So that's, that's another thing that universities should be resisting. Universities have gone along with it. It's been very lucrative for universities. Great, you know, we get 9,000 quid a year, fantastic. You know, we, we just pile on the money, but actually we should be resisting that. We, we should be pushing for a, a system where students don't end up with this massive great load of debt on their shoulders before they've even stepped out into the world. Well, we might want to do the university finance conversation offline, but I, I just one, an interesting counterpoint is that many universities would argue that actually they're losing money because university, the, the, the tuition fees have been frozen, right? Mm. So inflation has been eating that away. Hence the emphasis on international student recruitment because, mm -hmm. you know, we charge them more. Sorry for those of you who are here. Um, and that's seen as a way, essentially, if you, you're kind of matching the... And then hence the obsession with university rankings, because university rankings and lead tables are really important for international student mm. recruitment, because that's how they often prioritise. Mm. So you end up with this kind of uh, almost reinforcing yeah. uh, feedback loop of mm. the, 
the constant efforts to to get higher in the table, which is a zero sum game, which means somebody must go down, right? So yeah. it's like a red queen effect. You've got to run faster and faster just to keep keep um, still. Um, okay, so I just want to pick up on just that objectivity element again. Um, one, um, so scientists, particularly scientists who work in climate science, are very mindful of objectivity and consensus. Um, just recently, Jim Hansen's published a lead author on another one of his enormous papers mm. where he was arguing or has been arguing that probably uh, climate change is accelerating. So it's actually uh, getting faster because of a whole series of dynamics which maybe have not been explored as much as they could have done in the past. And one way that I would interpret or understand Jim's contribution is there's still a range of climate uncertainty right you know we have people in the room and that's a large part of their career and it's mm. a stubborn range mm. which means there'll be some people who look at research and it's more sensitive mm. and some less but this idea of the consensus i think evolved out of decades of attack by fossil fuel interests yeah. and where they want to pick off individuals and say well there you that's mm. because you've got a political agenda that's because you're funded by a political party and so there's been a kind of a tightening of the ranks in order mm. so you're not going to get picked off and attacked mm. But of course, the net result of that is, is that if you're dri if you are kind of almost hindered by the consensus, where on the one hand it could be better, but on the one hand it's worse, mm -hmm. societally that's not the same thing, right? Yeah. If it's better than we thought, okay. If it's worse, we could be in a really dangerous situation right now. So we could limit everything we think for two and mm -hmm. still get three, yeah. or maybe even yeah. four. And that part of the risk spectrum, that that part is, I think, has been very poorly communicated. And arguably, it's something that society doesn't want to hear, because if we really were to take that seriously, then we would be doing those radical things, that rapid decarbonisation. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there have been one or two papers recently point, pointing this out, saying, you know, there is a fat tail of climate risk, which, as you say, is very understudied. You know, most people are looking at what would happen at 1.5 and what would happen at 2. Um, and because that sort of aligns with government aims and, you know, it's totally legitimate to be exploring that. There's nothing at all wrong with that, but we urgently need people to be saying what happens at four and what happens at five, because these are within the range of possibilities now. And um, it's, yeah, I mean, the pressure to conform is in every single sector, you know, and, and I know, you know, I'm not suggesting you know, because on the other side, you get the climate deniers saying, oh, there's a consensus um, and there's an alarmist consensus mm -hmm. where where they've all sat together and in a huddle and said, oh, what, what coming plan are we going to pose in order in order to um, ensure that we get loads of money? Because we all know that the way to become really, really rich is to be a climate research scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than going into the oil industry or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, and so, you know, we've got to be wary of of sort of um, feeding that discourse because, you know, we, we know that that is used against climate scientists very much. But as you say, you know, the, the pressure is enormous. The pressure bearing down on people. We're, you know, we have an almost, I mean, the real consensus is in public life, is across the media and across politics, you know, where these are things you cannot discuss. You cannot discuss the system-wide forces which are driving us towards disaster. So when was the last time, put your hand up if, 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 if you can think of one, you heard an overt critique of capitalism on the BBC. <laughs> isn't this amazing? I mean, isn't this the most extraordinary thing? This is a system that dominates our lives. It's a totalitarian system in that it penetrates every single aspect of our lives. It dominates our thinking, it dominates our, our relations with each other. And it's a system driving us towards catastrophe. Yeah, and and, and you know, I'm not saying that state communism was better. It, it was also dri drove catastrophe. But it is the system, and we can't talk about it. It's considered illegitimate to talk about it. And I've literally been told I'm an extremist for, for, for raising it, even raising the question of what capitalism is. It's an amazing thing. You know, you hear... People say, well, you know, capitalism is the best of all systems. You say, well, what's capitalism? Well, it's buying and selling. No, it's not. That's not what capitalism is. There's loads of systems which did buying and selling. Capitalism is a very particular system, system which arguably, following Jason Moore's work, arose on the island of Madeira in about 1450. Really interesting. Um, it's, uh, I've written an article about it if you want to look it up. But So, um, and... 
and 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 so there is a very very strong consensus which crushes objectivity but that is not originating within science it's bearing down upon science it's it's a much much wider social consensus across public life which is crushing the life out of people like jim hansen who is is trying desperately i mean you know whether he's right or wrong is beside the point because you've got to be able to discuss the possibility that he's right and the um, climate system is more sensitive to, to to forcing than than than, than we thought it was. Um, you know, in every other sector, governments examine worst case scenarios. In this sector, they will only look at the best case scenarios. Yeah, and let's face it, two degrees is now best case scenario. That is best case. And we know that that is an extremely dangerous level of global heating, but that's all that they want to look at. They don't want to go to three or four. They don't want to know what what happens then, you know, which is part of the reason why um, so few papers are being published on that, because that's not what people are being funded to explore. And those who do go there, yeah, are subject to massive social pressure, not so much within the academy, though there is that, you know, and I know James Hansen, but I felt completely unwarranted attacks from certain other climate scientists. Um, I thought uh, you know, the, those attacks just didn't seem to be scientifically valid, let alone um, making any contribution to, to, to a proper discussion of this subject. But actually, they in turn are being borne upon by this massive social weight demanding consensus. But yeah, it does happen within academia too. And it happens through funding. For example, certain universities have relationships with oil companies. <laughs> We're very near the audience Q and A, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no one in there cut you off. But. No, no, sure, uh, but you know this does need to be discussed. I mean, you know, what attracted Exeter to the multi-billion-dollar oil company Shell? Um, it, you know, this is illegitimate. You know, we should not be taking money from these people. They are not our friends. You know, do we need to point out that oil companies at this juncture are not our friends? You know, in cultural institutions, people are now well aware of this within museums, within theatre companies, within art galleries. People, you know, there's been a massive um, cancellation of sponsorship contracts with oil companies. They're ahead of where scientific departments are. They're ahead of many environmental organisations which are still happy to take money from oil companies, and say, oh, maybe we can change the oil company. Oh, yeah, that's that's really how it works. Yeah, do what we say, or we won't take your money anymore. <laughs> Very powerful bargaining position there. Yeah, we know that organisations like Shell use these relationships uh, as as greenwash operations. That's the only reason that they fund these things. We know that because. The previous chairman of Shell said um, we, we need to form these relationships to gain what he called a societal license to operate. That's what he called it, a societal license to operate. So if you are collaborating with these oil companies, you are part of the problem. You are not part of the solution. There is no excuse left for collaborating with these oil companies because you are granting them a societal license to operate. And regardless of how much money Shell pours into Exeter or other oil companies pour into other universities, it's never worth it. Now, I know that in this university, you're being asked not to make any public statements about this. But you don't have to. You can just quote me. <laughs> and you can report that this, 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 this appalling, subversive influence came to your campus and said these outrageous things. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, this it's an intolerable situation, I'm sorry, but you know, it, this is 2023, and it's, it's as bad as a, as a medical department taking money from a tobacco company. Universities decided not to do that anymore in 1998 because of the social harm caused by tobacco. And they were quite right to do that, though they should have done that about 50 years beforehand when they first became aware of what tobacco was doing. But the social harm being caused by fossil fuel companies is orders of magnitude greater than the social harm being caused by tobacco, great as that is. So, sorry, but, you know, no, forget it. There are no excuses for this. There is no good reason for taking that money 
and giving Shell its societal license to operate. Let's go to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> It might be something that our audience members may wish to continue that discussion, and I'd be certainly happy to talk about it in, in I, I, I'm not here representing the university. Um, these are my own personal views, uh -uh, end quote. Um, but the way we're going to run this, I think, is we're going to take some questions here, and then whilst we're doing that, then there's going to be some questions online, and we are, I believe, being streamed by the wonders of technology into our uh, Farmer campus. So there's a group there um, who are going to be answering and offering some questions as well. So uh, it's over to you. Uh, so if you would like to put up your hand and let me just... Can I just say there's lots of men with their hands up. Yeah, and let's make sure it's not all men. <laughs> we, we typically have to wait for a while to get a bit more of a, of a gender balance. Yeah. Um, let's go. Uh, I'll take question right at the back with the white band. Yes, please. Okay, so um, do you think it's a problem with the education system that we're stuck in this town? Because yeah. I'm a professor law student, I'm being kind of pushed into the direction of joining the Magic Circle Law Club, mm -hmm. which obviously does not really coincide yeah. with um, like climate issues. So do you think it's something that needs to be enforced like, well on into like primary school? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so the question, um, in, in case you couldn't hear it, is, is this a wider problem with the education system that we're being pushed into these planet eating businesses like the magic circle of law firms? Um, the, the questioner is a law student. Um, I, I think this is a wider societal problem about how we measure success. Yeah. You know, and one of the things we get at school, you know, from a very early age is that competition is, is the determinant of success. And there are winners and losers and the winners are the successful people and the losers are the unsuccessful people but what we see from the environmental crisis as well as from many of our other social crises is that the only way we're going to succeed as human beings is through cooperation and through ensuring there are no losers and through ensuring that we're all winners and all winners as equally as winning as equally as possible and and so and I don't want to blame schools alone because, of course, you know, schools are part of the wider system. And I don't want to blame universities alone for exactly the same reason. But we have a, a social ethic which is profoundly destructive. And it is an e ethic which comes back to your phrase of the zero sum game. You know, some people will succeed at the expense of other people who will be do deemed losers. Now, that ethic is long standing, but it's been greatly reinforced by the dominant variety of capitalism under which we live, which is neoliberalism. And neoliberalism was, I thought, beautifully described by um, William Davis at Goldsmiths as the disenchantment of politics by economics. It basically replaces political choice with economic choice. It, it, in fact, it, it sees political choice as being fundamentally illegitimate. Uh, because you can discern the true natural hierarchy of winners and losers through buying and selling in the supposed marketplace. Of course, the reality is that the so-called winners are generally those who inherited their money or have had a whole load of other advantages, which put them way, way ahead in this putative race. Um, and But that has become the dominant theme now. So everybody is, is a winnowed into winners and, and losers. Um, and we tend to absorb these beliefs. Uh, it's what I call the self-attribution fallacy, that people think, I got to where I am today through hard work and enterprise. Well, yeah, if, 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 if hard work and enterprise was what made you wealthy, every woman in Africa would be a millionaire, right? Uh, it, it's, it, it's just, you know, people absorb that belief about themselves because that's the belief that the dominant forces in society are telling us. But it works the other way around as well, that people blame themselves for their poverty. They blame themselves for their apparent failures. You know, it, we, we, because we're constantly told it's your fault. You know, if your credit card is maxed out, it's because you're feckless. If you haven't got a good job, it's because you're not enterprising. Ignoring all the massive social forces which might be standing in your way. 
There's a lot of ableism in it. There's a lot of sexism in it. There's a lot of racism in it. We, you know, we know that um, there are loads and loads of things which stop people from e having even their basic needs met, let alone being these great winners in this in this highly competitive economy. Um, and we have to break that mindset. We have to escape from that mindset. It's just the same as the graduate starting salaries thing. You know that. That, that is the path to destruction. Some people might apparently win, but actually in the long run, we all lose from that. We all lose from the system which is consuming planet Earth and consuming us along the way, because that's what capitalism is. It's a fire front. It's constantly, it requires endless new fuel to keep it expanding across new frontiers. And that might be human fuel. It might be um, 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 uh, ecosystems. Uh, it might be uh, all sorts of uh, ways and ruses of extracting value from society, of extracting value from planet Earth. But but it, it burns around the planet. It keeps burning and burning and it uses up its fuel. And so it must go further and further to find less and less. And in doing so, creates even more damage. And it's driven, above all, by the ambition which is fostered this highly individualistic ambition to be a winner rather than a loser and to then congratulate yourself on, on your great skill of becoming one, one of those winners. So, yeah, I mean, you're right in that this is a, a very deep thing which is implanted in us from childhood, but it's not just schools. Schools contribute to that, definitely. Uh, but this, is, this goes deep and it needs urgently to be challenged. Thank you. Um, and also, have you heard of Lawyers Are Responsible? It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively new group that's looking at the Magic Circle and other legal firms to try to um, address their responsibility in brokering fossil fuel business. So um, that's a group that you might want. There's a plug. Lawyers Are Responsible. Um, do we have a microphone for the question? Right. OK. So I don't want to touch that. OK. So... There was a whole range of hands at the start, and then uh, I think you might have been first. Um, so, passing again on the Just wait for the mic, yeah. Uh, so, I'm hoping to return a little bit to the funding issue. So, you've obviously picked on Shell, which is maybe a soft target in the university, like most people might feel a fossil fuel firm where there's an expectation of internal change um, might be concerning. <laughs> The university here is also funded by JP Morgan, this business school that we're sitting in is funded by JP Morgan, so a funder of fossil fuels, um, and the Bezos Earth Fund, um, which obviously made their money from a fossil fuel, um, a, a system underpinned by fossil fuel, is funding some of the leading climate science at this university. So how should the universities choose who is an acceptable funder? And does it make a difference what type of funding is being, you know, where, where the funding is going to, what type of research? And at what point is the university leadership kind of morally complicit? At what point are researchers morally complicit? At what point are students morally complicit in um, the outcomes from that? Thank you. Well, these are all big questions and they're all good questions. I would challenge the premise, though, that Shell is a soft target. Uh, I mean, if it is a soft target, how many academic staff have stood up against Shell in public, spoken out against this funding deal? One, I believe. Not far from where I sit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Where is the public criticism? If it's such a soft target, why isn't it being targeted? Where are the people speaking out against it? You know, this is so, yeah, this sort of speaks to your f closing remarks that, yeah, we're all morally complicit in this if we're not speaking out against it. You know, and, and straight up, I mean, Shell, yeah, is an easy one to point to, which I think is what you mean. Doesn't make it it's a soft target. It's still a hard target, but it's a target. It's a great big target. <laughs> um, um, it's an easy one because it's so morally outrageous that any organization should be taking funding from Shell in 2023. It's just, uh, you know, what, what I think you mean to say is, is that it's a very black and white case. Yeah, there's no there's no room for nuance on this. It's simply wrong. But where are the voices raised against it within the university? How many of you have publicly spoken out against Exeter's deal with Shell? 
<laughs> Thank you. I mean, this is shameful. Yeah, we are morally complicit. We are morally complicit. I mean, I want to see you all speaking out against it. Please do. And if you all speak out against it, there's absolutely nothing the university will be able to do. Nothing. Because you know, you, you'll, you've got safety in numbers then. It's when people can be picked off one at a time that um, they and isolated and a sort of ring put round them and said that's that's a subversive person you know then then that person becomes vulnerable. We have to show solidarity on these matters. Solidarity is absolutely essential. Now, the other examples you you, you cite, you know, it, it's it's hard to know exactly where that line should fall because I understand that universities need funding and they're not getting enough of it. You know, and I take James's point about the fees and tuition fees and stuff, which, you know, so students are being hammered and universities are being hammered all at the same time. But, you know, we need universities to be coming together and say we need a different funding formula. You know, it shouldn't be this horrendous load landed on students um, which, uh, on which we depend. Um, and we shouldn't be having to make morally compromising choices um, of, of the kind you list. Um, I, it is difficult, you know, um, there are organizations where, you know, the founders made money one way, but the organization itself is not invested in that kind of money making. Um, you know, there, there are most of the time the lines aren't hard ones. Oil companies, the lines are absolutely hard ones. Thank you. Um, and then we'll go here. Oh, waiting for the microphone. Sorry. Oh, it's very loud. <laughs> can you can they hear you in pen really? <laughs> Hi. Um you asked in particular about the place of the humanities and the arts in the time of the ecological crisis. Because talking about getting hammered, the humanities are getting hammered, mm -hmm. and the humanities are one, they don't have the same pressures as sciences to be objective. Uh two, they're very good communicators historically, and three. Yeah, as you said, galleries um, and other kinds of cultural industries are at the fore of mm. yeah making the kind of protests that you're saying. So yeah, something about the arts and humanities. Yeah, is. thanks. So yes, I mean, I, I'd just like to reinforce this that the humanities have been ahead of the sciences in speaking out against fossil fuel sponsorship. That's a, I mean, you know, that's brilliant for the humanities, but it's a shocking state of affairs where science is concerned. A really a shocking state of affairs. So so. Sorry to keep harping on about this, but I'm pretty pissed off about it. Um, and you know, and I don't mean to single out Exeter because this is a you know, very widespread practice in universities, science departments taking money from fossil fuel yeah. companies, but also among some environmental organisations, like I say. And you know, then that makes me feel well. We need the humanities to hold everyone else to account. We need the humanities to tell the story of how we're going to get out of this mess. You know, we, we've got to try every which way of doing it we really have there's no magic formula for persuading people for bringing people online uh, for for um, widening the circles of engagement you know we, we have to keep trying everything and and i you know i've tried lots and lots of different things even including contemporary dance as a way a way of reaching people um and a music album and all sorts of stuff because i feel it's not enough just to give people the facts and figures and expect that's going to change their mind. It, it, it doesn't. It has to be embedded in, in a story which places people, which tells people, you are here. This is your situation. You could end up there or you could end up there instead. And, and the humanities can light the path to a better world. And you know, this is why we so urgently need interdisciplinarity. Um, which, you know, and I, and I totally understand the pressures that academics face, you know, you have to specialise to get ahead. And, and sure, you know, the great discoveries come from specialisation, but can also come from, from crossover, can come from two disciplines which have never met before, meeting each other and something amazing happens with that, that match. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's a tall order for, for academics, you know, be as broad broad as possible while at the same time doing your deep tunneling which is also necessary but then it's a tall order for all of humanity you know we are facing unprecedented challenges and we have to rise to them in an unprecedented way 
Thank you. I think what we're going to do is maybe take two more questions here before we look online and then probably wrap up with one or two here. Um, I've got, uh, uh, we take a question here and then you're in the first round. So I, I've eventually got back to you. So. Yeah, this is a bit of a simplistic question. So I'm, I'm really a bit, um, a lot of economic, um, you know, sort of aspects could kind of go in my head, but if universities and schools were to divest from such a corporate, the wall of you know, corporatism, you know, particularly like Shell and, and other like uh, oil companies, uh, where would the state have to actually step in and, and take responsibility, um, you know, in terms of the funding, you know, education, because obviously schools are underfunded, universities are underfunded. Where does the state need to take step in and take responsibilities and put things back into public hands. Mm, thank you. No, it's not a simplistic question at all. It's a very important one and a profound one. Because, um, you know, one aspect of neoliberalism is state failure by design. That's that's what it sets out to do. You know, the states are supposed to fail. They're not supposed to be able to deliver public needs. They're not supposed to be able to sustain strong public services to sustain an effective economic safety net. You know, it's all there in neoliberal theory. You know, all that's meant to be stripped away. And the the, the junk tanks, the lobby groups, uh, try to put that in into operation. And so everything is underfunded. I mean, we're in the most extraordinary situation, one of the richest countries on earth, and schools are collapsing, literally collapsing. The NHS is permanently overwhelmed. Our rivers are being turned into open sewers. Organized crime has taken over waste disposal. You know, these things have not happened randomly. This isn't drift. This is a result of deliberately formulated policy um, worked at for decades, you know, since the foundation of the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947, you know, where, where you had the creation of what um, Daniel Stedman Jones has called a neoliberal international, um, where where um, you know, very, very well funded by some of the richest people on earth, developing a network of, of junk tanks, of tame journalists and, and their media outlets, of academic departments, entire academic departments set up by, by, by some of these funders and individual academics being part, part of the network to, to generate support for ideas which at the time, you know, um, um, works such as Friedrich Hayek's and Ludwig von Mises, were, were considered just outrageous and ridiculous, but they built it and they built it and built it through the power of money. And the result is what we, we now see today is, is, is social crisis in every dimension. The poly crisis is the result of the success of neoliberalism. And obviously that has to be reversed, but we can't go back to how things were before. I mean, neoliberalism was able to step in in the late 1970s because of the broad failure of Keynesian social democracy. And it wasn't that there was necessarily anything wrong with, with Keynes's theories, with, with the general theory, um, but that capital found ways of, of um, circumventing it, um, destroying capital controls, destroying financial stability, um, fixed exchange rates, um, and and several other absolutely key elements of Keynesian economics, which then helped alongside other factors like the oil crisis to precipitate effectively its collapse. Now, capital knows how to do that. If, if you tried to recapitulate uh, what the French call the 30 years, 1945 to 1975, it would immediately be destroyed by the same strategies. Moreover, um, even Keynesianism, even Keynesian capitalism was a growth-based system in which prosperity depended on endless economic growth on a finite planet. And we know that doesn't work because it runs quickly into environmental limits. So we need new economics. We need a new political economy, a new social economy. Um, I uh, favor something I call private sufficiency, public luxury. We know that there is simply not enough physical or ecological space for everyone to pursue private luxury, which is the promise of capitalism. The promise of capitalism is that we're all temporarily embarrassed millionaires. That's why we go along with it. That's why we agree to it, because we think that one day 
we're going to be the ones in, uh, we, 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 surrounded by luxury, but it can't possibly happen. One, because in order to be those so, so-called winners, you have to exploit loads of other people. Uh, but two, because there's just not enough ecological space. I mean, if everyone in Exeter had their own swimming pool and their own tennis court and their own art collection and their own playground for their kids, Exeter would cover all of Devon. Where would everyone else live? You know, but and there's certainly not enough ecological space because you burn through the planet's boundaries in, in moments. But there is a, um, enough space for public luxury, magnificent public parks and public art galleries and public tennis courts and public swimming pools and public transport and public health systems, uh, which are you know absolutely brilliant and very, very well funded. We can afford that ecologically, financially, even in terms of physical space, because they create more space for people rather than taking space away. So we can each have our own modest private domain, our private sufficiency, but if we want luxury, we pursue luxury in the public domain. And that is what I see as part, just one part of what could be a different economy, one which is not a capitalist economy. But that's something we have to push for, something we have to design, something we have to argue for, something we have to write stories around in order to make that effective. Um, and so, um, yeah, we, we have to repopulate the public domain. We have to ensure we have an enabling state again, but different to how it's been before, but also enabled communities. You know, we, I don't think we want just top-down state provision. Important as it is, it's absolutely crucial. But, you know, that can mean that people as, uh, end up in provisioning silos and you can become very dependent on state support. We also need robust communities which provide social support, which own community resources, uh, which are fairly shared and fairly distributed, where you've got immediate local neighbourhood accountability. We need that too. So we need it to be bottom up as well as top down. And to go with that, we need participatory, deliberative democracy, not just a so-called representative democracy, which means putting a cross on a piece of paper every five years. Thank you. We have time, I think, for one more question here, then we're gonna go online. Hi, thanks very much for coming. Um, I agree that getting the message out there uh, is a very important part of the solution. I totally agree on that. But I feel that you're requiring a level of personal, individual sacrifice that I don't see happening in time to avert a crisis which is already unfolding. Um, for example, you've said a couple of times that uh, students shouldn't uh, take the starting salaries into account when choosing their careers. I come from a poor family uh, in one of the poorest areas of one of the poorest cities in this country. And I can absolutely tell you that though I am very interested in trying to avert what's happening, salary was a big part of the decision uh, to go into the field that I did. Um, so I'm worried that you're not just betting the farm, but betting the whole planet on a change of character that I feel is not going to happen in time. Uh, it, it, it worries me. And I feel that alongside what you're uh, advocating, which I do support, we've got to have other measures as well. And one of those is to try and encourage government to take decisions which are not only environmentally good, but economically beneficial. So for example, we have the situation at the moment where subsidies um, are biased towards fossil fuels and against renewables. That makes no sense, not just environmentally, it makes no sense for the incomes of individual people because renewables are cheaper but in people's pockets. So I would like to advocate that alongside the uh, activating of, of human uh, uh, social uh, preferences on this, uh, we also uh, recognize the power of a 
uh, a redesigned economy which doesn't resign, uh, rely totally on personal action. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. Well, I mean, I completely agree with that. And that's, I guess, what I'm calling for is a redesigned economy. You know, we're not going to do it just through individual action. You know, we're not going to do it just through <clears throat> things that we, the decisions we take within the sphere of our own lives. In fact, we're constantly being driven towards individuation because the strategy of power is atomized and rule. This is why we're constantly told we are consumers rather than citizens. And we're constantly told that if we want to create change, we should change the way we buy things. We should be good consumers, better consumers. Actually, the problem is we're consumers. You know, the, it's we're consuming the planet. The planet is dying of consumption. And the uh, and in fact, there's quite a lot of interesting research work showing that there's very little difference between people who think they're ethical consumers and people who think they're just consumers. Uh, what makes the difference is your level of income. The more money you have, the more consumption you do and the more damage you inflict, regardless of what colour that consumption might be. So we're not going to solve this individually. You know, governments want us to think like that. They want us to think that, that the only action we can take, and in fact the only action that is valid to take, is individuated action. Uh, but actually human beings have only ever been powerful by working together. Yeah, and that's what they're desperately trying to stop. In fact, they're criminalizing working together to change the system. Just this week, Michael Gove um, um, proffered a new definition of extremism, which is um, trying to overturn or undermine um, uh, our, our democracy, our institutions, and our, um, and our values. Thank you, our values. Yes, exactly. Well, I very much want to overturn Michael Gove's values. <laughs> um, I very much want to overturn the system that he calls political democracy. And I very much want to uh, undermine and overturn the institutions that, that sit behind that system. Uh, that makes me an extremist, apparently, and I should be of interest to the police. I blinky well hope I am of interest to the police. <laughs> be mortified if I'm not, but... But, um, you know, we, we, we have, you know, he's trying to stop us coming together even more than already. And of course, yeah, you know, in a system of winners and losers, it's seen as a sacrifice if you don't take the route of the winner. But you know, that's a system we should be challenging. You know, we need to create a system in which we are all winners and that your winning does not depend on having a higher salary than, than, than other people have. We need a system in which no one can fall through the floor, in which poverty is no longer a threat because there is a, a basic distribution of resources, which means that everyone's needs are met. It, with a system of public luxury, um, we can ensure that not just people's needs are met, but people's desires are met as well, without taking away anything from other people. So it's absolutely systemic change that we need. But you know, we have to start from where we, are, we where we are. And you know, anyone would tell you, I wouldn't start from here. But sadly, here and now is the only starting point we have. And here and now, we have to start urgently. And so we have to operate at every single level that we can. And universities pushing people into planet-eating machines, that's not good for people or planet. Thank you. Now, do we have a question online? Okay, so we have a, quite a few questions online. We'll start with Bill Spence. I'm a member of Divest USS, and we have been pressuring the huge uni pension fund USS to divert to divest from fossil fuels and the funders, but so far they won't. What do you think will persuade them? Yeah, I, it is amazing that this divestment hasn't happened, isn't it? It's it, it's collaboration, you know, and, and previous generations would know. That, that is the word you, you give this, is collaboration. It's collaboration with this death machine, this planet-eating system. Um, and it's, it's the same as um, the system of universities taking, taking money, direct funding from, from, from these fossil fuel corporations. Of course, we should be divesting. What persuades them? Well, yeah, that's, that's another matter. Are they persuadable at all? If they're not, who do they claim to represent? You know, who, who are the real lords and masters here? Are they, 
are they the pension holders or is it is it the corporations in which they're investing and again there's split incentives involved you know when you look at what the corporate incentives faced by the pension funds are they're not necessarily to to represent the the pension holders but um you know they get paid for um other metrics which might in the long run be very bad for pension holders and so unfortunately again it's another institution which sorry michael gove we 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 need to undermine and overturn so i uh, sorry i don't have a more specific answer to that thank you on to the next question from dan bloomfield if you're a university vice chancellor for a week what new subjects topics or issues would you focus on for better education and research outcomes wow um thanks dan <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> That's a very challenging question. I mean, look, I mean, a large part of, you know, I don't want to detract from this, you know, for very large numbers of people at the university, carry on doing what you do, do because it's amazing. You know, we, we, we urgently need your research. I depend on your research every day of every week in, in, in my job, as indeed many, many other people do. I wish actually that more journalists depended on your research because journalists as a whole are completely scientifically illiterate. Uh, you know, when I um, I once went to a meeting of 150 senior television executives, I was speaking at the meeting and I asked, how many of you have a degree? Almost every hand went up. How many have a science degree? Not a single hand went up. And if anyone in the media has a science degree, they're almost certainly a specialist scientific reporter. In the newsroom, in features, in, in, in uh, the higher levels of decision making, very, very few people have a science degree and this this is a shocking failure but anyway I'm, I'm distracting from the from 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 what the question is asking so i think i think communication is is a, a really crucial issue that you know we do need to train academics in many cases to be better communicators to um to understand better what is required to turn their findings often very important findings into a language that people can understand. Universities have got a lot better at this, but there's still some quite significant failings, you know, and I see really important papers just slipping completely below the radar and no one picking up on them. Um, huge issues just disappearing. I think we, you know, we also, and I know it's an endless call that people make, you know, we do need to see as much interdisciplinary collab collaboration as possible because, you know, it is so often when different disciplines meet that, that magic happens. And, and I know that all universities are committed to this and talk about it a lot, but, you know, still the incentives are often for extreme specialization in, in, in one particular area. Um, I mean, there's, you know, there are massively underfunded subjects like soil science. You know, soil is arguably the most important ecosystem on Earth. 99% of our calories come from it. It's more or less a black box to us. We, you know, there's talking to some soil scientists recently, they say we still don't actually know what soil is. It's an amazing state of affairs. Yeah, we, here we are spending billions of dollars on the Mars rover program to characterize the surface of that planet. And we know almost nothing about our own. Amazing. It, it's, it's these lacunae, it's these, it's these issues which, which, which far too few people are studying, which often turn out to be the most important issues of all. Not much of an answer to your question, Dan, sorry. But um, uh, yeah, I'm sure everyone everyone here has got some good ideas as to what universities should be doing and aren't. I'm quite excited about the idea of George being a guest vice chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> See, you didn't. The mention... university would never recover. <laughs> you didn't mention systems thinking, which I know. Uh, yes. Looking yes. at society is a complex system, and obviously systems mm. thinking. Some of the students here are benefiting from that yeah. for education at the moment, so that's yeah. quite important. Well, yeah, and, and of course, Exeter is actually a, a leading institution for systems thinking, world leading, and there's some, some really amazing systems work going on here. And I, I, I use it quite a lot. In fact, I probably draw on that more than on almost any other um, output from any other university in, in, in the world. It's really, really important stuff. But it remains the case that in most degrees, there is no clear explanation of how complex systems work. Now, everything that's important to hu humanity is a complex system. 
human body, uh, human brain, uh, human body. Yeah. Human brain. God, I can't even get that right. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Which bit? Yeah. Um, ask. Oh, no, <laughs> um, 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 human brain, the human body, human society, human economy, the financial system, the food system, every ecosystem, the oceans, the atmosphere, they're all complex systems. And yet, most people are never taught the basic principles of how complex systems operate. If we're taught about these things, we're taught as if they're simple systems, we'd like circuit diagrams, like uh, as if it were an, uh, were an electric network or, or a plumbing system. But that's completely different from how complex systems operate. It's like being taught French and told it's maths. It's, it's misleading, it's miseducation to teach complex systems that way, which is why complex systems are constantly taking us by surprise because they don't operate like simple systems. They operate on totally different principles. Changing complex systems is not linear and gradual. You know, they'll absorb pressure and absorb pressure and then they'll suddenly collapse into a different equilibrium state. And we say, oh God, how did that happen? Or that's never going to happen because we can't imagine it. We can't imagine that different equilibrium state, but that is inexorably how complex systems are going to behave. Um, and and not knowing that, I mean, yeah, thanks for bringing me up on this, because it is this massive gap. Every single student should be taught the principles of complex systems, regardless of what your study area is. And actually, that should be happening at school as, as well as at university. Um, I mean, it, it's amazing that it's not the case. If only there was an online course <laughs> or, I know it's like systems thinking for sustainability challenges. Oh, that I mean, would be brilliant. Wouldn't that yeah. be good? Yeah. 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 yeah, I'd love to see that. Maybe yeah. Google that later. Yeah, no, no. We, no, no one would have come up with something like that. <laughs> we have um, officially four minutes. So if anybody's got a, a quick, yeah, yeah, I saw you raise your hand earlier. So unfortunately, we do have to keep this quite short um because i think we do have a kind of 715 couple but please do ask your question um hi i'm i'm an academic here at exeter and you were talking about systemic change and one thing that i keep thinking is that we collectively academics in the uk are have a position of influence over the brand new voting generation people who might be coming up to vote for the first time in their lives ever next year how do we galvanize that force? How do we galvanize that opportunity that I think we have uniquely more than any other group of professionals in this country? Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's crucially important. I mean, you know, I don't want people to think of themselves as being in a role of indoctrinating students in politics, not least because students themselves have a lot to teach. Um, and, you know, what I'm very keen on is is the Friarian system, which I became familiar with when I worked in Brazil. I used to live in Brazil. And 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 the system encapsulated in Paulo Friari's book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, um, was is a tremendously powerful educational method, which is about mutual learning. And and the educator becomes the educated. And you 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 it's this sort of exchange of you know, the contextualization which the educator can provide with the lived experience of, of the people at the other end of the chain, then informing the educator. And in Brazil, it led to extraordinary situations where entirely illiterate populations became super politically aware and highly versed in quite complex political notions with transformative effects in, in, in many communities. And I that when it comes to politics, it's a kind of exchange I would love to see between academics and students. Um, because actually, I think students, you know, I think the, the, the Greta generation has a great deal to teach all of us. In fact, I think they know things and seen things and have experienced things and felt things that older people need to be knowing and seeing and experiencing and feeling. And yet somehow that's not penetrating. And so the ethos is it can't be top down. It must be, when it, uh, for sure, you know, when you're teaching your specialist subject, that, that has to be to a degree top down. But when it comes to a political education or an education as human beings and education as citizens, that has to be an exchange among equals and a, and a mutual learning system. I think that is a lovely 
place to it. I'm terribly sorry, we have run out of time. Just for George Burson. Borrowing from a recent documentary outing, would it be helpful if he went to prison? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for those who are online, uh, George, would it be helpful if he went to prison? Uh, it could be, <laughs> yep. And and it's something I thought, I mean, I've been arrested quite a few times, but I've never been to prison. And one of the reasons for that is that in the old days, people like us didn't go to prison. You know, we, we would get fine. We got beaten up a lot. That was the way they dealt with us was they deployed private security guards to beat the crap out of us. Uh, but now the new laws are sending people to prison. Um, uh, people, including Eddie here, who's been to prison, what, twice now? Yeah, and and um, that, to me, it should be one of the highest marks of social approval. <laughs> that is your top qualification right there, uh, going to prison on behalf of humanity. Um, and, yeah, uh, that is, is something I've thought about. The What I recognise is that it's basically a full-time job. You know, being prosecuted now is a full-time job, and they deliberately make it that way um, to stop you doing anything else. So the question I need to ask myself is, is it more valuable for me to keep on doing what I'm doing or more valuable for me to go to prison? And that remains an open question for me. And, and it could well be that I reach a point where I say, actually, I'm not adding much very, I'm not adding very much more now um, to what I've done before or to other people's efforts. So it'd be better for me to break the law and go to prison. Um, whether that would have the desired effect or not of encouraging other people to do that, uh, uh, only time would tell, but it's certainly not an option I'm closing off. Thank you. Yeah, we mentioned Jim Hansen earlier, um, sometimes described as the godfather of climate science, gave the famous testimony in 1988 and um, was arrested. Uh, didn't go to prison, but he was arrested uh, a number of occasions and in protest against the US government inaction. We need to consider what did that actually achieve in, in the broader context. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and also, just to close up, I wanted to reflect on, we had a discussion earlier about mutual learning and the, the inspiration that we get from uh, our students. It is, um, I feel I learn more from my students than I actually educate them. And the, the vision and the values and the courage they have is certainly something that I find incredibly inspirational. And I know it's why I can continue to, to, to do the job that I do. So. Thank you to all my current and past students uh, and all the other students that are joining us, um, have joined us today. Well, I'm afraid that's it. We're out of time. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you for those who have joined us online. Uh, we are going to have a short amount of time, I think, to mingle. There is some free stuff still left outside to consume. But other than that, uh, all that's left for us to do is to say thank you very much, George. Thank you.